Presbyterian minister found himself in the state of Delaware, where he made some uncomplimentary uh, remarks with regard to the Union flag. These remarks landed Isaac William Kerr Handy into the prison in Fort Delaware. Fort Delaware was located on Peapod Island in the middle of the Delaware River. And Isaac Handy uh, recorded uh, his uh, experiences within that prison. He published a book later on of his experiences called United States Bonds or Duress by Federal Authority in which he reports the kinds of experiences he had within that Union prison. He speaks of prisoners and rough treatment that they experienced under, at the hands of the soldiers. He spoke of prisoners dying and being dragged out from time to time. In the Lord's mercies, he received a pardon, I believe, from Abraham Lincoln and was released from prison and returned back uh, to his ministry. That prison was very hard. Perhaps an even harder prison was in Andersonville, uh, Georgia, a renowned Southern Confederate prison where thousands of Union soldiers perished. One Union soldier reports of his first entrance into the prison. He tells the story of walking into that prison and seeing their once hale and hardy men, strong, vibrant men, walking around as skeletons with their skin disfigured and uh, covered with filth. He saw at the, in the middle of the prison a swamp, and it was there that they had to wash themselves in waters that were polluted by their own excrement. Uh, many of the men died there in that Union prison. The Confederates had a hard time figuring out why they were dying. Uh, perhaps in part it was due to the fact that uh, the food, food provisions were infrequent and poorly prepared. Perhaps, too, of course, the unsanitary conditions of the camp contributed to the poor health. In any case, some speculate that hookworm dysentery affected the Union uh, soldiers and many passed away. Life in prison was hard, much harder than what it is today. It might have been even more merciful to die out on the battlefield than to be dragged off to prison. The Apostle Paul writes of the experience of those of us who were once under the law. We were imprisoned by the law. The law was a tutor, a schoolmaster, or some perhaps even a little bit more forceful, a guard, to drive us to Christ, to show us that we were in a hopeless situation. These images of horror that we see in our own Civil War past uh, are images that do not come anywhere near to seeing the spiritual imprisonment of the souls of men in the bonds of sin, under the dominion of the law, with no hope of escape on their own. But Paul, in speaking of the ministry of the law in the hearts of men, moves on to a most glorious uh, assertion. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We've been set free from the law and its demands through Christ. We are no longer obligated to observe the law as a means of finding favor with God, as a way of finding our way out of the prison. No, God, by His mercy, takes us out of that prison, washes us, cleanses us, renews us, declares us innocent by His grace. And Paul goes on even beyond that, beyond the fact that we are regenerated in Christ and made new, have a new heart, a new nature, and power to live for God, beyond the fact that we are justified in the sight of God so that God is not only our creator or recreator, he is our judge who declares us to be righteous in his sight, Paul goes on to say that we are now sons of God, we are adopted into his family, he becomes not just our creator, our judge, he is also our father. Through Christ Jesus. It's an astonishing transition for the people of God. Once enslaved and captured in sin, once bound in the iniquity of sin with no hope of escape, and now delivered freely and powerfully, renewed by God's grace, given a clean record, and even further, 
brought into the very family of God. We are made sons of God. I rather think that the Gentiles who are hearing this, perhaps for one of the first times, at least for some, might have found that this language was astounding, impressive, amazing, and maybe raised some questions. How are we the sons of God? How does this come about? And what does it mean to be a son of God? Are we in some way divinized? Do we in some way become gods through the work of Jesus Christ? What did Paul mean by saying we are the sons of God? And perhaps even for the Jews who were listening to Paul, the Judaizers who might have heard or read his letters, their first impressions of hearing Paul say that you are sons of God through faith in Christ might have caused them to step back a bit and say, Paul, what are you saying? Are you out of your mind? How can you say that we are sons of God? We are children of Abraham. Yes. But sons of God? That seems to be too much, Paul. You're going too far. It's a great blessing for us to be sons of Abraham. That's what we hold to, but to say that we are sons of God moves us much further along. What did Paul have in mind by describing the people of God as God's very sons? If we look at other places where Paul uses the same language, you will find in Romans, I believe it's chapter 10, towards the end of the chapter, where he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, the first chapter, where Isaiah speaks of uh, us being called the sons of God. And so Paul found an Old Testament uh, starting point for his understanding of how God would make us not simply uh, the children of Abraham, but also his very sons. Going on from there, perhaps Paul learned the kinds of things that Jesus would say to his disciples. Perhaps in Paul's conversations with Peter, James, and others, he learned of what Jesus had to say to the disciples, how he told them in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And Jesus taught all of his, his disciples to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus made a point of saying that we are the children of God. We are God's very sons. And so we are heirs of special privileges. Perhaps that became all the more apparent, or perhaps even uh, more importantly so, with Christ's resurrection. In the Gospel of John, we find that Jesus uh, meets with Mary Magdalene on that first resurrection morning, and he greets her by telling her that she is to go to her to the disciples and say to them, I am going to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And so here with His resurrection glory, He appears before His church and announces to them that they are the children of the Father. They are sons of God. Surely we can see something of the progress of redemptive history the development of God's grace, and the marvelous transformation that occurs to the child of God when we are renewed in Christ, when we are justified. I remember years ago, sitting in, too many years ago now, <laughs> sitting in a classroom at Van Til Hall, Westminster Seminary, and listening to the great Scotch theologian Sinclair Ferguson lecture on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that captured my attention and, and, and stuck with me all these years, perhaps the one thing that I remember him talking about, other than the marrow controversy, we'll talk about tomorrow, <laughs> it is, and I remember being about the second row, third seat over, looking at him standing behind the desk with his nose up in front of him, and him, he would just start reading through his lecture and going along, and there were 40, 50, 60 students there all feverishly writing away, at least I was. And he made the comment with regard to the doctrine of adoption, our adoption into the family of God, that it is regrettable that there's a lack of focus on our adoption in Christ. And he pointed out the, uh, a, a couple prominent systematic theologies, one by Louis Burkhoff, where he says that 
uh, Burkhoff gives only two-thirds of a page to discussing uh, the doctrine of adoption and, and actually subsumes that under the whole subject of our justification uh, by grace through faith. Uh, he also speaks of a, a Southern Presbyterian of the 19th century, Robert L. Dabney, and says that Dabney also only has a half a page given to the notion of our adoption. And so much of more recent Reformed theology seems to have paid very little attention to the whole idea of our adoption into the family of God. And the focus is all very much on our justification. And certainly, that's obviously important. Luther called it the, the crux of the Christian faith. But we shouldn't miss the additional blessing that God has for us to be called His very sons, to be included in His family. It is a blessing that goes beyond just simply the law court forensic declaration that we are righteous in Christ, that our record has been solved. We no longer are cover covered with our sins, we are covered with the righteousness of Christ. That's obviously a tremendous blessing. But God even surpasses that when He brings us into His very family and calls us His own sons. Now I want to note the language of sonship here in what Paul writes here. In the New International Version, the more recent uh, translation which I have, it speaks of we're all, you're all children of God. And that much is true. Sonship includes us as the children of God. We have an inheritance from our Father. We are blessed in Him. He gives us His fatherly care, protection, and provision. But the Greek is specific here. It uses the male gender, sons. You are sons of God. And Paul does not do that out of cultural uh, bias or uh, a sense of uh, paternalism in, in any respect. Rather, it reflects the way that God has revealed Himself and His purposes throughout all of redemptive history and the special role that sons had within families as those who would receive the inheritance from the Father. They will be the ones who would principally receive that inheritance and the name of God upon them. And they also were the ones who in some ways represented the rest of the family. There was a kind of headship associated with the male mind. And women were included within that line. The language here is important for us because it shows us Christ and His work for us. He is our head and representative who acts on our behalf when He saves us from our sin. And it's through Him that we have an inheritance that is complete. These aspects of sonship I think in some way get diminished when we just use the word children in that they lose some of the Old Testament history and distinctives that go into that. In any case, Paul describes us as the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 